Welcome to session three. Now we have our third and final Kiwi for the day in Carl Fitzpatrick, uh, who's the bin manager from Auckland Airport. Now, as architects, we need to be aware and we need to know where we're heading. Uh, now, having a presenter like Carl here who is working for a client, an asset owner, uh, him being here and presenting and explaining what his expectations are from a client's perspective is perfect from my perspective. You need to know where the clients want us to go. What information do they need for us to be able to build our processes and workflows to enable us to meet them? So for everyone today, I hope that this is an insight into what expectations currently are for an asset owner, and, and it's a major asset owner, but what you'll see moving into the future is it's going to start to trickle down um, through all asset owners as government agencies and, and private investors start to recognize the value of digital deliverables. And it's not specifically about models. It's just about better information, um, standards and deliverables. So I look forward to seeing what Carl has to say. I look forward to the, the questions that, that we have at the end of this session. So take it away, Carl. Thank you for the introduction, Nathan. It's great to be back for another uh, crack at a 24 hour event. I thought we all learned to stop doing uh, 24 hour events at architecture school, but you're a real sucker for punishment. So thank you for inviting me along again. It's great to be part of another uh, ArchiCAD user event um, and to talk and share information to uh, people around the world. And I look forward to seeing the other 23 presentations. So, for those that don't know me, my name is Carl Fitzpatrick. Um, I'm the Building Information Manager at Auckland International Airport in New Zealand. And before I um, switched to the client side at Auckland Airport, I did work in the architecture industry um, over in Finland and also a bit in New Zealand. And I also studied architecture uh, in New Zealand for five years uh, when I was a bit younger. So um, in my time on the architecture side of things, I you know was designing but also managing the BIM process um, and heavily using ArchiCAD and then I saw the opportunity that you know there's a lot of information captured through a project and I would um, I didn't see many clients taking advantage of that so I saw the opening at Auckland Airport and then jumped on the opportunity to move back to my home country of New Zealand and try and figure out a way uh, and lead a strategy for how an asset owner and an operator can um, take advantage of all this um, information that's been produced by architects and engineers and contractors throughout the building uh, development process, but then how do we use that going into the operational phase? So today I want to sort of talk about, you know, some of the examples of how we've used information, but also um, give you an idea of our overall strategy and the foundation to set this up and make it possible. So for those that don't know much about Auckland Airport um, or never had the opportunity to travel to New Zealand, we are located in Auckland. Uh, we're at the bottom of the world and we are New Zealand's largest airport and we connect New Zealanders to the world. So before COVID, we had about 20 million passengers and it dropped right off to below a thousand per day. Um, and now we are looking to, to rebuild that and starting to reconnect routes and um, to around the world and try and build up that passenger volume again. So hopefully we can get to 20 million and then beyond. And to accommodate this growth and also um, streamline our customer experience, we are um, undertaking a huge project. Uh, it will be our biggest capital project to date, which will be a 3.9 billion New Zealand dollar spend, um, which is building this new domestic pier, which um, takes some of the capacity that's currently in our um, existing domestic terminal down the bottom here and bringing it uh, into a new pier, which is connected to our international terminal, and then also connecting to a new car parking building that you can see here to the north. So this is um, going to be a huge advantage for people who are you know, coming from abroad and then traveling to other major centers around New Zealand that they'll be able to, to just progress through the same terminal like they can in most places around the world and not have to uh, walk across or take the bus to our domestic terminal. So this project um, is, very large and it requires a number of different um, consultants and projects to enable this project to happen so there's all sorts of readjustment of the airfield there's buildings that need to be built to attach the existing terminal which then 
this new pier attaches to, new car parking and landscaping, as well as other adjustments within the terminal to actually make it possible that we can then expand out in this direction. So my role at the airport has been uh, to try and improve the quality of our existing information to, su to supply to the designers and architects uh, of the, you know, the existing situation. So doing a lot of laser scanning and modeling from that, looking through the historical documentation and trying to bring this into the BIM world. And then also setting the foundations for how we uh, get this information from the supply chain for any future projects and how they start to contribute to that um, existing model so that we can take it into operations. So on this uh, presentation, I would really like to show you the steps that we've taken and the, the thinking around um, how we do that and give you some insight as architects, how you could actually um, get on the front foot with your clients and, and have some of the documentation uh, ready so that you can uh, be more uh, proactive in your approach to dealing with your clients. So where I sit um, is on both sides of the fence. So I have to deal with the asset creation and that's where I see BIM has been a key thing is you know that 3D design and coordination, but then also lo looking across to the asset information piece and how we, in asset information management, to how we create value from that data and not just shelve it at the end of a project. So how do we make use of it and what are the, how do we bring it into the various use cases that come about in the operational uh, phase of a building? So if we wind it back a bit to the, the history of how we came to BIM in the first place and why we, as an airport, are taking a, a proactive approach to it is that if you go back to our traditional way of managing information, it was purely you know, paper, that's what technology enabled at the time. It was paper documents stored in an archive um, and having to you know, recall those uh, bits of paper. And it's really you know, boxes and boxes of information and having to trawl through pages and pages of information, try and find what you need. And often when you do, it's, it's almost like chicken scratching. So uh, over the last sort of uh, 15 years, the airport's been progressively improving this information. And as technologies have progress so too has the way that we then um, store the information as well as uh, disseminate it to the wider business so we go from paper it's then scanned um, and then those scans are then digital but then beyond scanning it was taking those documents and actually consolidating the information within them in CAD files um, so that created you know better and consolidated floor plans and you know as architects did new projects they were producing the sections and details and things like that in CAD um, so it's taking those and then pushing them into a database world of GIS. So a geographical information system um, was set up about 10 years ago, and that has had a huge impact on the or positive impact on the business. And now it's like a widely used way of finding information across the business, which I'll, I'll show you shortly. But that um, sort of evolution then led to or laid the foundation for moving to BIM um, because you know, we had a lot of information, but GIS is typically good for stuff in the landscape and that high level planning. And until recently, it wasn't so good at the building, dealing with the level of information that comes within a building information model. So um, about six or seven years ago, we started the process of trying to um, convert a lot of our building information into the BIM world. And that's then just brought another layer of information and a more granular level of detail to how we can understand our building and it's having a positive impact in the way that we can um, deliver new projects but also get an understanding of our existing building and trying to improve its performance and then beyond that we move into this world of, of linked data and connecting you know our GIS data BIM data to other data sources within the business such as financial data maintenance data risk registers and and things like that so where we, we currently sit with BIM, as I would say, we're, we're between a file-based world where you've got, you know, your Archicad or Revit files or your IFC files, and we're sharing those between each other to moving towards a database world where you've actually got a lot of the information stored in an external database, such as Dorofus in our case, and you're then linking that through um, to, to the models. Um, Whereas in GIS, it's sort of, it's moved beyond that database world and it's starting to connect already to other systems. So we're now trying to bring our, our BIM world up to that same level as the GIS world and then starting to integrate the two and then connecting them to, to wider uh, data sources. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, GIS and BIM and how they relate, um, 
one easy way to look at it is uh, looking at you know the essential elements of each. So in GIS world, you've got points, lines, polygons, and annotation, or it should probably be called attribution. And if you look at Google, you know your your restaurant favorite restaurants that's often marked up as a point. Your road is roads are marked up as lines, and you know your cities or your neighborhoods are, are represented as polygons. And then all the information that 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 feeds into that is uh, is the annotation or the attribution. In the BIM world, we then have um, objects, elements, spaces and solids, or zones in the case of ARCHICAD, and then the properties. And essentially, these can easily be translated between the systems, and I'll, I'll show an example of that later. But, you know, an object in, in uh, BIM, such as a door, you can easily find, you know, export a schedule or a CSV file with its X, Y, Z location, and, the, and then all its attribution of the door, and you could turn that into a, a point within GIS and then you know have that shown on a GIS um, plan. And here's an example of our GIS system at Auckland Airport. So um, here we have a, a floor plan and then we've got our some information on top which is showing you know point information which is uh, various displays and signs and flight information displays. So if I click on one of those information displays it will then link through to a live database of that particular sign and then show you what's is um, visible on that sign within the airport at this point in time so there is the easy ability to make a connection to live data and then to be able to find that information spatially so as a airport um, an asset owner to find this just makes it a much easier way to find information for people and just access a whole range of sources of data. They don't need to know the, the original source of the data, they just need to know what they, you know, what the piece of information thereafter is, like such as the element, and then all the, that, the back end of GIS and the BIM world pulls that through to them and they just see this, this nice um, user interface. Then we've been going to the effort of uh, modeling up our buildings, including you know, things such as the signs, and that same sign here shown in 3D and, you know, in an ideal world, we could link that um, same display information to the 3D model element and that would start to build this you know, real world representation of, um, of our building in a digital form and enable, a, a, from an operation perspective, to be able to go into a model and save us having to go back and forth to the terminal each time and actually have um, collective conversations uh, around the actual space and um, look at ways we can improve things to optimize operations. But in order to make this all possible, we need to, across a large building, we need to have um, a survey control network or an understanding of how things tie together. So a proactive step that we've made is building a survey control network, which is both um, has a physical marker out in the real world but also has we've got it in our BIM models as well. So you can get a BIM file which has digital copies of these um, survey markers in their actual location. And then when you do a project for us, you can you need to include at least three of these points in your file. And then we can then use that to make sure that it aligns with the other models in your in the project that you're working on, but also with our existing building. So this has played a huge part in actually tying all of our information together. Whereas in the past, it was all each project was kind of done independently, and you know they would if you brought the models together, they could be miles apart. So now everything that is done at Auckland Airport comes to its geolocation, and we can all pull those together and get a a building wide and campus wide view of our world um, in three D. And in terms of the, the assets that we're interested in and what we're trying to capture information on, we've got a, a range of asset typologies. So here with our team, we've broken it down into the different asset types. Um, so we've got the, the six key fields or the ways that we look at buildings. So we've got or look at assets. So we've got the buildings, the airfield infrastructure, underground infrastructure, horizontal infrastructure, such as roads and airfields. And we've then got the natural environment such as you know vegetation and any um, sustainability stuff and then we've also got spaces and zones so that's looking at um, not just the rooms but how um, you know where are security zones fire zones what are the commercial zones lease boundaries that type of stuff and across the top of all that we've, we've, we're looking at how 
all these assets are operated. And then we're trying to break them down into their subtypes so that we can uh, build requirements that are specific to the, the t asset type. Because what we found is you know, when we list out all the assets that we're interested in, there's you know, over 600, but not all these projects have 600 different element types. So we want to be able to say, I'm doing a um, commercial property um, at this stage of a pro and I'm at this you know, concept design or develop design of a project. And these are the, the elements and um, parameters that I need to consider rather than just giving this massive list and saying, you know, you need to do this because that, that scares a lot of people off. And then communicating our standards, uh, we've developed this uh, asset information delivery manual, and this has been a, a key step in communicating our requirements to the supply chain. And this says, you know, this is what we're trying to achieve, this is why, um, and this is how we would like you to do it. And it's not telling people how to do it in terms of what software they're going to, they have to use. It's more, this is the information that we need, and we leave it up to the supply chain to develop the process around how they can do that. So there's many ways to achieve um, a project and deliver a project and you don't have to always do it the specific Auckland airport way like we don't say that you have to use Archicad to do all of uh, your modeling um, so we understand that the supply chain uses different tools and there'll be projects where someone uses Archicad and someone uses Revit and someone uses Tecla for structure so we we accommodate that and we don't try and place restrictions on the supply chain um, which I see a number of clients doing so I think if um, if you do have clients that are trying to force you down an alternate route of software, then I think you need to learn how to communicate with them and say, you know, it's not about what software is used, it's about what information is shared and, and how it's coordinated. And there's many different ways to coordinate across across a range of tools. So this guide is it's fully about open standards um, and, you know, being clear on our requirements, but not clear on the, like, specific of how you have to do things and then another key step within our projects is making sure that the projects have been led by goals rather than saying oh you have to use um, BIM or you have to model in 3D or you have to do 4D BIM it's really about what are we what are we really trying to achieve with this project and because we have all those different asset typologies that the goals can be different depending on the typology so rather than having just a catch-all that you have to do these particular BIM uses. It's more, okay, what's the goal? How are we going to, going to achieve it? Why are we trying to achieve that? And then what are the enablers and the processes um, and tools that we use to achieve uh, the, the overall goal? So, um, you know, an example here is reducing design and construction risks at project interfaces with existing and future built infrastructure. That's the goal. And it's important for us because we have so many projects, we've got a live environment um, and you know a lot of things climbing over top of each other. And that's that's what we're trying to, to achieve is reducing the risk. So to do that, we need the, um, to provide reliable context data. So we're going out and we're laser scanning our existing building. We're providing models to, to our design teams to help them coordinate their new designs into um, and we're really um, trying to provide clarity on the level of information shared. So we're applying um, A, B, C, D ratings to the reliability of the information so that people can actually start to tr build trust in that data. And the reason for that is because, as I said before, it's complex. We have an operation, a building that's operational 24-7, 365 days a year, and we want to reduce any delivery delays and risks um, as the as construction goes on so because we do not want to affect airport operations so to achieve that you know it's a combination of design authoring it's having a, a, an environment set up to share information doesn't mean everyone is working in the same tool but it just means that people are sharing data that's structured in a common way such as ifc and it's coordinated um, by its location and then it's been shared on a regular basis so having this stuff documented and set out at the start of a project with your client is key and it shouldn't be seen as a I will just leave that to the BIM team. It needs to be done at the this project delivery strategy level um, and using digital as a, a key enabler rather than just as something that you have to do because the client asked for it or because you think you know, that it's the right thing to do. I think it needs to be made a key part of the project delivery strategy because it, it 
using digital modeling has has great benefits to projects and, and it continues to show for us time and time again. And another step further, so you've defined your goal, you defined how you're going to do that at a you know, with the, your technology setup and the, the processes. And then the next thing is going to another level of detail. And so us as a client, we provide this asset information requirement schedule, which then informs a model element authoring schedule, which says, you know, these are the elements that should be be modeled on a project. We've broken it out by stage saying, you know, these, you know, we want doors at concept design and we want them at all the other stages. Um, and then these are the different attributes that we need to be included in those elements at the right stage. So this um, enables us to be clear in what we actually want at each stage. And then it gives us something to measure the delivery against uh, and working towards having a, an accurate as-built handover at the end of construction. Too many times we've, it's been too vague and then there's this massive debate at the end of the project around what information should have actually been delivered. So this here um, you know, draws that line in the sand and is clear on what we want. And one thing from a architecture perspective is that it's it would be quite uh, easy for you all to actually within your firms if you haven't already to develop one of these tables around what are your minimum delivery standards at the moment and what what would require additional effort through delivery so that you can actually go to your a client your clients and say you know this is what you're going to get out of us you know we model in 3d um, for a, as part of our design process this is the information we have is this of use to you uh, is there things that are missing and you can actually benchmark what you currently deliver a standard and then try and there's a potential to upsell additional stuff um, through the process so having that actual your minimum standards documented would would be a, a, a i see it as a, a an advantage another key thing that we've been focusing on is um, building up uh, a framework and making sure that we sort of follow some key principles um, so for us, it's having these, these four solid foundations, which is you know, committing to open standards and making sure that we're not pigeonholing our supply chain into a particular tool, but saying, you know, this is the data that we want this. We want it in an open format. You can produce it in its native file, but as long as it can come back to us in both, you know, native and in say IFC or land XML, XML for example, we can then utilize that and we can share it with different parties. And in many cases, uh, and particularly in our case, we're using um, models for a whole range of things such as visualization and 4D planning and um, you know, interrogating models or even doing some sort of side studies of design. Um, and just having it in the open in IFC, for example, we can take that and use whatever tool we want to continue working with it without having to keep demanding extra things of the of the delivery team, which are beyond the scope of their actual design project. So for us, that's a, a critical enabler within our, our organization. The other one's having flexible technology. So building up a system that's not reliant on one platform, it's having, you know, by using open data, we can use multiple platforms and then we can then start to tie things together. And if we want to sub one system out, we can sub a new one in. So, you know, for example, 4D modeling again, you know, the tool we use now, such as Synchro, it might all of a sudden there could be a, a better tool come along or, um, it might integrate into another tool we already have so we could then drop that out and still continue with the 4d piece um, but it doesn't you know we're not hamstrung by having put all our eggs in one basket and i think now with um, a lot of software you know, being software as a solution and on the yearly subscription you can start to actually you know it's not a huge loss to switch at the end of the year to another another tool so you don't have that um, like lock in because you've you've made a decision 20 years ago. Another key thing is building strong partnerships, uh, both internally and externally. This just enables things to get done. So we really engage or like to engage with our supply chain to, you know, where we're introducing new tools and, and process of working. We work with them to, um, you know, try and iron out the, the processes and the, the issues and help them rather than just saying you must do something this way and expecting them to figure it out on their own. So really being collaborative in our approach to um, digitizing our built world, because I think there are a lot of, it's, well, it's very easy to just hide behind a contract and say, oh, it's your job, you go do it. But, you know, we're learning things, the supply chain's learning things, and it's it's critical that we share information and really just improve the, the quality of, of delivery. 
And then the other one that goes hand in hand with improving quality is building capability within our organization and not just hiring the expert here and there to do it, but it's making our project managers, our design managers comfortable with using the models and the information that we're receiving from our supply chain to actually, you know, do design, um, design management and checking the coordination rather than just you know, relying on the traditional 2D outputs that can come from a BIM model. So it's actually taking advantage of, of the, the level of information that's being produced and not just always using the watered down version and leaving the, the more detailed view to just the, the people who can model. So on top of our foundations, we're then building up um, processes. So we have a process of every um, year we refine our and redefine or well, continue to define our standards um, and we're you know, improving the way that we can then communicate those in the supply chain. We're continually consolidating information. So we're pulling together all the existing information we can find uh, pulling together any new design and ASBIT models and bringing them into our environment and making sure that everything ties together and it's all you know, nicely federated and can be shared between, uh, across different tools. We're also verifying the information. So a lot of information that we've got in our models, it's from a design model and it's not necessarily accurate. So we're going through and laser scanning, on-site checking, observation, um, filling out surveys as going out on-site and using that to then verify the actual model elements. So we've now started applying an A, B, C, D rating with A being the highest and D being the lowest for the confidence of the asset location in our model, as well as it's the information that's contained within it. So then when we supply information at an element level, you'll be able to you know, get an understanding of how much you can rely on that piece of information. We're then enriching um, our models by you know, adding more information that's needed from an operational phase. So we're not expecting our design and construction teams to add information that's only useful for us from an operation perspective. So that sort of stuff we would like to enrich in the models and, and our databases and take care of. And then we're con constantly refining our standards. So talking to the asset owners and uh, people around the business and supply chain to understand what information do you actually need and in what format and where, sh where is it best placed to then you know, refine our standards so that we're making it constantly making it easier to to capture information, find information, and just you know not place too much burden on on project teams to deliver it. And then once we've done all that, we can then start to make the connections to the different databases around the business and understand how does our BIM data talk to our GIS database, how does our um, GIS data talk to our financial register, and also how does that feed back to you know if I click on a particular element in the BIM model, can I find find a link back to the the financial record of that and to help with the delivery we um, sort of like to look at it in, in three pieces of you know how do we work from capturing existing building doing new builds to then connecting that to a wider business so you know desktop studies of 2d documents consolidating those improving the way that we can store and find those um, gathering our all the existing models that we have, whether they're design BIM, construction BIM, scan to BIM, we're then doing um, surveys, traditional surveys as well as um, point cloud surveys. You know, now we're starting to um, take advantage of, uh, you know, the, the LiDAR capability of an iPhone, for example, to do underground or doing um, scans of open pits for underground utilities when they've been installed so that we can actually get an accurate record of the ASBO information and then using GIS applications to, to capture data out in the field. And then in terms of production, we're um, requiring that all of our projects have done uh, 3D models and every discipline's producing models where it makes sense. And then we're also connecting it to a database. So we're starting to implement Dorofus for capturing room information, item information, product information, and system information. And all these tools can then be fed you know, that's producing structured data that can be fed to produce um, different dashboards and you know and pushed into different model viewers so we have a range of you know we might view a model in gis we might view it in say revisto or we might view it in celebri or someone might view it in navis but we have a range of tools and dif different people can access their data in different ways depending on their needs and then longer term we're then starting to connect that data to the other databases and and the enterprise-wide system so 
here we have uh, the enterprise data hub. So it's how do we feed building data into there so it can then talk to you know the um, computerized maintenance management system, building automation system, fixed asset register. How do we then use you know finance might want to build a dashboard of taking information about spaces and rent values. They could build you know in our Power BI experts so they could build something there. Um, and you know, linking in sensors, all that information we can start to connect. So that's that's a big step going forward. Now that we've sort of got our design and construction process um, ironed out and you know always improving, we now want to start to look at how we can connect that to the wider business and unlock value across the operational phase. So that's the uh, sort of the the background for how we've got to where we are. Now I'd like to show just a bit of a highlights reel of you know GIS and BIM. And our evolution through the 2D, utilizing 2D information to 3D, and then how we think that we can connect that into a range of data sets in the future. So, I'll just uh, talk over some of these these captures, um, and you know, it gives a real flavor of what what sort of stuff we're doing at Auckland Airport at the moment. So, um, I sit within the spatial information team, so this is just our showcase. So. 2D data visualization. Currently, we utilize GIS. This is our GIS viewer. Um, you've got all these personalized uh, views of the data or maps that people can go into for different use cases. So here's one for building space information. You can go in, you can see an underlay of the floor plan, and then you can get information about that zone. So, you know, see who the tenant is and leasing information, etc. Um, we then have building emergency plans. You can click on a, a sign, and then straight away it will take you to an image of the sign that's actually located in that location. So you don't have to walk around the building to find out all this information and see what's the, the latest sign in the area. We also have all the utility information and we're then now working to improve that and, and make it uh, 3D so we can use it for more detailed coordination. We're building apps for, for data collection out in the field. This is very useful during the floods. And we also use it from like mosquito tracking and management for biosecurity um, purposes. So you can easily go out in the field and collect, collect information about things, or it could be an asset and build these uh, questionnaires to fill out and it all feeds back to a database. And then those th that information can then be used to build dashboards. Moving forward, we're going into a 3D world. So we've been building up this model, as I said, through various means, laser scanning, taking contractors models, design models, whatever we can find we're piecing together and we're now starting to provide that information out to you know, tenants and, um, and enabling people to actually design in a detailed view of, of our terminal. And it just improves the quality of planning, it reduces risk, and it just makes, makes things a lot easier. Here's an example of a new project that's, that's dropping in next to our, or tying into our existing building. And it's an expectation that all design teams are coordinating in 3D, modeling in 3D, and making sure that at a project level, everything is nicely coordinated. And um, here we've got, you know, the, even though it looks like one project, there's still a separate piece for the, the baggage handling. There's a, a services trench off to the, the left-hand side of the building. Um, and then there's also the existing building models that we're taking care of as part of our role at the airport, but then also the designers models. And then you start to plug in more projects. And so here's another building that's going to tie into that previous project and then a neighboring car park that's been built at the moment and all this, the landscaping around it. So we can start to, to tie that all together and um, you know really make sense of things at a, at a federated project to project campus wide level. Um, and as you can see, there's, you know, there's gonna be millions of elements in these models and there's all different people working on each project um, and how do you pull that together and can make sense of it and, and the BIM models make that a lot easier for everyone and then going forward we then start to have you know accurate models of our existing facilities and we can then start to link the information to databases and make it much easier to find associated data so here's um, assets that are linked to a Dorofus database and we can then store all those documents in the database, create a link to the models and we can then just jump from you know, a 3D model or it could even be turned into a point in GIS and then jump to the to a record of that and have all associated data. So it just it makes it much easier for people to find information based on location and um, pull it up without having to understand a full folder structure. Here's another project which 
This was our first one that's followed the asset information delivery manual from start to finish. And what it resulted in was a fully coordinated project through design and construction, a project that was delivered on time, on budget, um, and then gave us a full record of asset information with everything verified through on-site observation and checking. So the contractor delivered their models. We had an independent party then checking the location and information quality of these things, and then feeding back to the contractor to make adjustments. So there was about 900 or so adjustments made to the models post-construction to bring the, the construction models up to as-built standard. We're also trying to coordinate our existing utilities in 3D um, so that we can avoid future utility strikes, which is a, can be is a quite a common occurrence and very costly. So we're trying to minimize that. At a campus-wide level, we're looking at what well, we are coordinating on a monthly basis, our our delivery schedule at a high level um, and you know looking at you know what's project to project like can we actually build this project is something going to get in the way or delay it and you know it can this type of planning can actually avoid building an entire project because it just might not make sense from a coordination perspective so it has huge uh, cost uh, benefit and also reduces risk and then at a more granular level we're doing that at a individual building level with trying to tie into an existing environment. We want to understand that construction sequence in detail. And then we want to also be able to go one step further and even start to plan all the um, temporary works around that. Uh, in terms of as building, here's an example of how we are intending to um, capture, make sure that our as built, our, what's built is actually, or what's modeled as it was actually built is, you know, using a combination of 360 walkthroughs, laser scanning and taking overlaying against the models and then verifying the location to make sure that it's uh, in its right spot. So this here is where we're sort of heading in the future and it also enables us to have a full view of the terminal without having to go back and forth to the terminal just to talk about particular things or check something out. And this makes it much easier as well to model, to improve our existing building model because we can just walk around uh, on our computer screens and, and, and check against the models. So this has been a useful tool. Um, we're doing a lot of ground penetrator radar scanning to get a better understanding of our underground services and understand the actual Z location of assets. And then we'll use this information to build up a 3D model. Also taking our design models and um, using these within GIS to do view sheet analysis. So now this is helping figure out what's the optimal position for an air traffic control tower, a new air traffic control tower based on our master plan and plan projects with the different heights that a tower could be and what you can actually see from that tower. And that same logic can also be applied at the building level for, you know, um, there's CCT camera location, seeing what a camera can see. And this could also be observation points of what could a person, person see. Um, and this just helps you know, optimize that planning. So it's how do we take the models and improve the way that we design so that the actual performance of the building is, is better. And then to the next level is applying actual usage information over the model so that we can then start to get a, um, a understanding of the capacity of the building and how it's actually used. So this is looking at the, you know, the performance of the building from a user perspective and how people, um, you know, what's the queuing time going to be when they get to the, the aviation security screening or how how are the check-in kiosks going to be used? Do we have do the airlines have enough kiosks? So this is just really about improving um, our understanding of how a building can function, and then using that to inform uh, design interventions to actually improve the end user experience of the building and then just reduce the stress on the traveller and improve their time at Auckland Airport. So that was a, a quick wrap up of all the projects and hopefully uh, a broad understanding of what the foundations have been um, to enable all this. I think as architects, you can um, really help your clients understand what's possible because a lot of clients don't know that. So I think you should, you know, understand what data you're capturing and how they actually use that data downstream of construction and then looking at ways for how you can work with the contractors through construction to make sure that the architectural models are actually as built and handed over the, to the client. It's often the one discipline that's actually just sort of left 
and no one's really taking ownership of, um, whereas the, the services are actually being updated by the contractor, but many contractors don't want to, to do the architecture uh, model. So there's an opportunity there for architects to actually factor that into the price and offer it as an additional service to the clients. So if, you, if you've got any more questions, just feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or fire a question um, in the next 10 minutes in the Q&A and uh, hopefully I can help. Um, so over to you, Nathan.